Well, Senators Amy Klobuchar and Rob Portman have wrapped up a visit to Ukraine. Yesterday, they met with President Volodymyr Zelensky and Ukraine's defense minister to discuss the war. Senator Klobuchar tweeted about the meeting, saying, quote, I'm more committed than ever to supporting Ukraine's fight for democracy and sovereignty. The meeting happened on the same day that The Washington Post reported that Ukraine has developed a fleet of wooden decoys resembling U.S. rocket systems to trick Russian forces into wasting long-range cruise missiles. Meanwhile, new reporting alleges that back in April, peace was a very realistic possibility. According to reporting in Foreign Affairs, the tentative agreement called for Russia to withdraw to its February position in exchange for Ukraine promising not to seek NATO membership. Joining us now to weigh in on all of this is Aaron Mate, host of The Pushback on the Gray Zone. Aaron, welcome. Good to be here. So I heard uh, you talking about this in the context of an interview you did recently with Katie Hopper on Useful Idiot uh, with Noam Chomsky. And, you know, Chomsky very compellingly laid out all of the ways in which uh, the U.S. media machine has been going, working in overdrive to prevent people from realizing that there was um, uh, an off-ramp to this crisis. Can you talk a little bit about that? We talked about this last time I was on your show uh, in March. There were talks between Ukrainian and Russian negotiators, and they had set uh, plans for a meeting in Turkey to finalize an agreement. But Boris Johnson from the UK uh, came in and basically told Zelensky no and said to him that even if you reach an agreement with Russia uh, based on security guarantees from the West, we will not provide you with those security guarantees, basically making any such agreement meaningless. And Zelensky took the orders and the talks were sabotaged. Now we have, from the American side, confirmation of what was reported in the Ukrainian media. And that comes in the form of Fiona Hill writing in Foreign Affairs that, yes, during that same period, Ukraine and Russia had worked out an agreement uh, where Russia would basically withdraw to its pre-February invasion position, uh, controlling Crimea and also uh, controlling or at least having close ties with the breakaway regions of the Donbass. And also Ukraine would pledge not to join NATO. That was the outline of a peace agreement that Fiona Hill says was reached between Ukraine and Russia. What she omits was what we talked about last time, which is that Boris Johnson, and Boris Johnson did this coming from the U uh, with U.S. orders, obviously, told Zelensky that the game was off. And so that's why we have still today this war going on. That's so frustrating because, like, what, what is the point? The point of NATO was supposedly to stop conflict between Russia and European neighbors. So if we can avoid this conflict with it, like, NATO is not an end to itself in theory. It was supposed to avoid a, a, a very conflict like this. So it is so frustrating that you know, by by the accounts you just laid out, what sounds like a good, uh, a good, in, in fact, as good a peace agreement as Ukraine could ever get, because it can't, you know, un unilaterally win this war, defeat Russia, and cl and claim all that territory. That's a great deal. And, uh, and, and, you know, what do you make of the short-sightedness of, of not just, well, Ukrainian officials, but U.S. officials on, on this question of, the, of how the war will be resolved? From the start, I've been warning that the U.S. is more committed to hegemony and enriching the military industrial complex than it is to anything else, including Ukraine's sovereignty and its stability and well-being. And that's been obvious by U.S. policy in Ukraine going back many years. You can start with the coup of 2014 in which the U.S. backed the overthrow of a government. That set off a war that we don't really talk about in the U.S. media, but it's important. For the last eight years, there's been a very deadly conflict inside Ukraine. More than 14,000 people have died. The U.S. has been fueling that with billions of dollars worth of weapons and sabotaging the peace accords, the Minsk peace accords that were reached to end it. And, you know, overall, look, on your point about NATO, it's the same thing. NATO, you could once say, existed to confront the threat of the Soviet Union. Fair enough. That threat dissipated when the Soviet Union collapsed. Yet for some reason, the U.S. has overseen this expansion of NATO since the early 1990s right to Russia's borders. And as the scholar Richard Sakwa says of the University of Kent, NATO exists to manage threats confronted, uh, created by its own existence. Hmm. And that's exactly what NATO has been. It's good for weapons manufacturers. And that's why whenever NATO expands, they spend a lot of money lobbying lawmakers in Washington. It's bad for everybody else. 
Yeah, Chomsky made this point on, on on your show as well, that every time the war is referenced, it's referenced as a, an unprovoked conflict, the unprovoked invasion, the unprovoked invasion. And he was very careful to say, you know, of course it isn't, the fact of it being provoked isn't a justification for doing it. But you've never really heard that terminology being deployed before the way it's being used now. Every, every really reference to the invasion characterizes it as an unprovoked invasion, which is kind of a tell. It, it, it points to, you know, subtly actually tacitly points to the fact that it was a, a provoked invasion and that the rhetoric is doing work over time to try to make people not have that conversation. And the importance of noting that there was a kind of a provocation that you're describing here isn't to say, again, that Russia isn't culpable for making the choice to invade another country, but that there were off ramps that were available to the West before this that could have been avoided the conflict if that was really the priority as opposed to some of these other priorities that are emerging, like weapons manufacturing and you know US hegemony, et cetera. And, and so I, I wonder what you make of that as you've been trying to report on these issues and receiving a lot of blowback yourself. And also I wonder if you can just give us an update about what's going on on the ground uh, to the best you know understand it. Well, look, as you say, just because Russia was provoked doesn't mean it was justified. And I can't accept the argument from Russia that they had no other option but to invade Ukraine. Uh, why didn't Vladimir Putin, for example, do what he's doing now, which is reduce energy supplies to the rest of Europe? Or why didn't Putin even give a public speech aimed at the world saying, look, I've been put into a corner. This war has been raging in Ukraine for eight years. The U.S. won't and Ukraine also won't respect the Minsk Accords. Uh, NATO is expanding. The U.S. has also been dismantling nuclear arms control treaties that allow for the placement of offensive weapons threatening Russia. P Putin could have said all this, but he didn't. And uh, so Russia is culpable for its own decision to invade. But that doesn't mean that Russia was not provoked. And as Chomsky says, you will never hear the invasion of Iraq by the U.S. referred to as the unprovoked invasion of mm. Iraq. And so the fact that we have to hear so often that Russia's invasion uh, was supposedly uh, unprovoked just speaks to how uh, desperate people who support this invasion are to cover up the actual factual background. And it's unfortunate that we, we, we've been prevented from learning about the background because the U.S. media won't report it. And look, a major obstacle is that we have no progressives in Congress who traditionally are aligned with being anti-war willing to speak out. Every single Democrat, including the squad, uh, and Bernie Sanders voted to fund the proxy war, voted to uh, support the use of the Lend-Lease Act, which speeds up the transfer of U.S. military equipment uh, to Ukraine, voted to expand NATO recently, and voted mm -hmm. to call on NATO countries to spend at least 2% of their GDP on the military industrial complex. So the challenges uh, in speaking factually about the war are compounded by even those who traditionally are anti-war are supporting this proxy war, which yeah. makes uh, support discussion very difficult. Hollywood, the celebrity class, journalists, people who are, from my perspective, sometimes annoyingly counted on to uh, to back liberal <laughs> causes, they're all going for photo ops with Zelensky. They're, they're doing the opposite. They're giving moral credence to the idea that the war can be won with just with more effort and we have to stay the course. That's like that's what you're hearing from people who who would have theoretically could have been counted on perhaps to be more anti-war. Yes. And, you know, Zelensky himself is a sad figure because he was elected in 2019 with a huge mandate. More than 70 percent of the vote voted for him because he was promising to end the war in the Donbass, to make peace with the Russian speaking rebels. What did he do instead? He escalated the war uh, and he refused the opportunities he had to avoid this catastrophe. Now, I lay most of the blame in Washington because, as was warned about at the time by the late scholar Stephen F. Cohen, said to me in, in an interview in 2019, just as the uh, Democrats were impeaching Trump for briefly freezing some weapon shipments to Ukraine, Professor Cohen warned to me that unless the U.S. has Zelensky's back and supports his peace mandate, then Ukraine's far right will win, that they will sabotage the only chance they have in Ukraine to make peace with the rebels and avoid catastrophe. And the U.S. chose instead to continue fueling the war with weapons that Trump was impeached for briefly impeding and to side with the far right. And it's led us to where, where we are today. Mm. Well, Aaron, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Good to be here. Thanks for having me. And stick with us for more Rising in just a minute.